We're very happy to have Robert Thibault with us on the channel uh, for his uh, fifth year in a row here speaking at the Chaos Communication Congress. Uh, today's lecture, Robert Thibault, uh, you probably know him uh, as a lawyer involved in the Snowden case. Um, his uh, lecture today is called The Continued Erosion of International Law and Human Rights Under a Global Pandemic. And, um, and yeah, let's hear it and uh, we'll be here later for a Q&A. Good evening. Uh, I'd like to thank the Computer Chaos Congress uh, again for having me speak at the convention this year, um, even though due to the global pandemic, uh, it's by a remote. But uh, as you may be aware, um, I'm the lawyer for the Snowden refugees. Uh, and also I'm introducing another one of my clients, Ibrahim Hussein, who is a refugee and journalist from Somalia. And uh, just to um, inform anyone who's, who's unaware at this stage, the Snowden refugees were a group of refugees from South and Southeast Asia who provided uh, shelter, uh, food, and compassion and humanity to Edward Snowden when he was in Hong Kong in 2013, when uh, Mr. Snowden made the disclosures on the NSA's uh, electronic mass surveillance program. Um, and also to provide an update on, on my role as, as a lawyer for the Snowden refugees, I continue to act for them as a barrister in their Hong Kong cases. And um, within Canada, I was granted uh, special, special authorization to act for the Snowden refugees who still have refugee claims with the Canadian government. Um, and... Just briefly, um, I have a slide up with the Snowden refugees sitting together in Hong Kong. Um, on the left side is Vanessa. Uh, she's from the Philippines. Her daughter's below her. Uh, that's Kiana, born in Hong Kong, stateless, and is still um, stateless today. Um, beside Vanessa is Ajit, the former soldier from Sri Lanka. Uh, and beside hi him is the family of four uh, Nadika, Sapun, both from Sri Lanka, and their two children, Satendi and Dinath, also born in Hong Kong, stateless. Um, of the seven Snowden refugees, uh, two of them actually succeeded in their cases in 2019. And, they, and this is a photo, there's a photo I have up of myself uh, meeting with Vanessa and Kiana at uh, Pearson International Airport in Toronto on uh, March 24th, uh, 2019. Um, a year ago, I talked about the uh, decline in human rights around the globe. Uh, nothing has changed since a year ago. Um, and with the COVID-19 global uh, pandemic, things have just gotten a lot worse. Um, governments have been empowered, emboldened to um, to continue to attack uh, those who dissent, who, who are critical of government around the world. Um, and what has made matters worse are the people's inability to go out and exercise their rights of freedom of expression, association and assembly and protests because of COVID um, at, and for public, public safety reasons. And the government is, has used that to their advantage to uh, abuse uh, civilians in society. Um, the media as well uh, has been consumed, in my view, by the global pandemic, as well as other significant global uh, news stories, such as the U.S. elections and Donald Trump. What this has done is it's taken uh, the media away, journalists away, from other important human rights stories around the world. So, so those who... Um, whose cases or their circumstances are not high profile, a lot of these stories are not being reported anymore. They're not being investigated anymore, which is adding to governments uh, being aware that they can continue to commit human rights violations around the world with impunity. Um, now, I have a client from originally from Somalia. He's a journalist, um, and I'm introducing him to the public in this presentation because 
he fled persecution uh, as a journal- journalist in Somalia, and he found himself in Hong Kong for a period of time in an untenable situ- uh, situation and had later found his way to the European Union to seek refugee status there. And I'd like to go into that. Um, and basically, um, Mr. Ibrahim uh, had covered news stories in Mogadishu and in and across Somalia. And he was uh, targeted by both the government and uh, al-Shabaab. Um, it was a situation that uh, Jiki has, and there's two quotes here, which I'll read out. Uh, which really encapsulate the circumstances on the ground. Um, G, uh, Ibrahim has stated, In the morning we hugged our family like we might never see them again, because every day in Mogadishu, journalists may be killed in the crossfire or murdered by al-Shabaab. And he also stated, For a big story, we would bring two or three cameramen to record the scene together in case one was wounded or shot. Um, as as a lawyer for, for uh, Ibrahim, I've actually seen footage that they've recorded of, of, you know, people on the front lines they were with being shot dead. Um, and, and this is a horrific situation for any journalist to be in and to report in. Um, the situation for Ibrahim came to a crossroads in 2009 when he was kidnapped by al-Shabaab. He'd been targeted by the government as well, the police and also officers of the Ministry of Information and Culture. But it was al-Shabaab who grabbed him, tortured him, um, threatened him, threatened to kill him with a knife, uh, gun to his head, and demanded a ransom of 18,000 US, which fortunately his family was able to secure. And after six days as a hostage, he was released. Now, Ibrahim had worked for Universal Television um, in Somalia uh, during two periods, and um, he had fled Somalia for a period of time to try to find refuge in another part of, of Africa, which didn't work, and then tried again where he found himself in South Sudan, uh, which was, uh, there's no durable solution there for him. So in September 2013, he fled to Hong Kong. And he sought asylum there. His thinking was that Hong Kong had a reputation of civility and um, rule of law. But upon his arrival, he, you know, he realized that he'd been seriously mistaken. Uh, immediately, he was arrested and detained at the Calcio Peak Bay Immigration uh, Center. Uh, for short, uh, we call that CIC. And it's basically Hong Kong's version of a gulag. Um, and there's a an award-winning human rights story by Olivia Cheng from Hong Kong called The Invisible Wall. I've provided the link on the slides so you'll be able to to read an English version of that that story. Now, after being locked up for three months, he was released on recognizance, which is um, he's provided with a paper that typically foreign criminals are provided with. And on the outside, he faced destitution and uh, racial discrimination. And he was constantly racially profiled by the police, stopped all the time, threatened, and uh, Hong Kong so- society itself um, just basically ignored him. It's like it's as if he didn't uh, exist. He had no food or money for the five months after he had been released from detention. And uh, International Social Services, a Swiss organization with a branch in Hong Kong, provides humanitarian assistance um, as a contractor for the Hong Kong Social Welfare Department. Uh, But still, for five months, uh, he was destitute, no food and uh, no money. Um, And in 2013, uh, my slide, there's an error, it says 2014, but in late 2013, um, Ibrahim showed up at my office with another um, one of his colleagues uh, who had worked for him in Somalia. And... uh, they had. They were wearing bedroom slippers and uh, used clothing, and they they were starving. And uh, I immediately took up their cases with the UNHCR in Hong Kong. And um, subsequent to that uh, that meeting in my office, uh, my wife uh, took both of them down to um, out of her own pocket to purchase shoes for them, running shoes, and also to buy them some food. Now, Jiki is what I would describe as a victim of constructive refoulement, and I'm going to go into the law on that in a few minutes. But basically, 
the Hong Kong government has a le legal and policy framework that's designed to break down the mental health and physical health of asylum seekers, um, basically through social isol isol isolation and uh, deprivation of sufficient humanitarian assistance so that they don't starve. Um, and Jiki described a situation uh, a few days ago, looking back, after the asylum-seeking community protested and occupied social welfare and international social services offices in 2014, protesting not having enough food or rent money to survive, it felt like my mind was breaking. I felt I would die in Hong Kong. Abraham's mental and physical health declined in Hong Kong to the point where uh, it was a choice between not surviving in Hong Kong or, um, you know, trying to get to another country. Uh, the South China Morning Post reported his situation as a journalist, and uh, the reporter stated, um, an experience of the worst in humanity was not what Ibrahim Mohammed Hussein expected when he touched down in Hong Kong eight months ago, fresh from persecution in Africa. Now, I mentioned constructive refoulement, and this is a, uh, a framework and um, a strategy that's implemented by the Hong Kong government and um, professors at Chinese University um, have described it as follows. Given that a necessary consequence of the government's policies is social exclusion and destitution, there are major concerns, particularly for the mental health of refugees. This is especially the case because refugees stranded in the territory faced indefinite periods while claims are processed, all the while plagued by uncertainty. Such, such concerns not only raise the issues of compatibility with the ICESCR, and ICCPR, but also place the individual concerned at risk of returning to the source of danger, thus offending the doctrine of constructive refoulement. So Hong Kong's prohibited from returning anybody who's seeking asylum in Hong Kong uh, until after the cases are screened and rejected. Okay? But the Hong Kong government, um, in parallel with, you know, with the, that policy that they have to follow, uh, the law they have to follow to screen refugees or asylum seekers, is they make their lives so miserable, so difficult, that these asylum seekers' mental health deteriorates to the point where they give up and they, they would rather return home to die there. Ibrahim left Hong Kong, but under international law um, and Hong Kong's policies, uh, they sent him back to Somalia. He was quickly targeted again. And over a number of years, he sought internal flight relocation alternatives within Somalia. It didn't work. And then he finally left Somalia and found his way to the European Union, ending up in Greece. Uh, the first camp he was put in is the Maria Maria uh, refugee camp, which uh, Ibrahim describes as a place of violence. Uh, there was violence on a daily basis. There was a lack of resources, food. Um, the conditions were inhuman and degrading. And uh, Ibrahim himself and the people in his uh, makeshift uh, structure where they stayed uh, were attacked on seven occasions during that time. And um, uh, the other thing that Ibrahim has, has, has stated is that uh, the, the police just stood by and watched. They allowed that to happen. They acquiesced to the violence against other refugees. And um, the plus side of... Abraham making it to the European Union was there is a screening process that proceeded quickly compared to Hong Kong. And the second uh, plus is that uh, the screening system in the European Union countries um, actually grants refugees, refugees that status uh, if they can make their case that they have a well-founded fear of persecution. In Hong Kong, the acceptance rate was zero. And Hong Kong not being a signatory to the UN Convention relating to the status of refugees, um, you know, even if you succeeded, you could not obtain refugee status in Hong Kong, uh, and you could not resettle there. And this is a picture of uh, Ibrahim at the Moraya refugee camp. Uh, there was a arson and a large fire at the camp, which left him five days on the streets outside the camp, and then he would be sent to the Lesbos refugee camp thereafter. Um, 
Now, with his acceptance as a refugee in June 2020, <clears throat> um, he was still stuck in the camp. And here's another photo of uh, Ibrahim uh, when he went to the Lesbos camp. There were no toilets, no showers, lack of resources. And, um, and in late 2020, uh, the Greek government uh, moved, uh, allowed uh, Ibrahim to leave uh, the camps, and he's now living in a Greek community, uh, supported only for a limited period, out of, a period of time by the government in January 2021. Uh, there's a mistake on my slide. I have 2020. It should be 2021. Um, he'll have to fend for himself. Um, and I, I've brought up, uh, introduced Ibrahim here to everybody today because he, he's been in both Hong Kong and he's found his way to the European Union. There are serious problems on both sides of the, of, of the globe. Um, but he is, uh, grateful that, uh, he, the proper screening is uh, apparently happening in the European Union, and he's now safe. Um, in my view, he's an extraordinary person, um, extraordinary journalist, and there are very few journalists like this on the planet um, with his commi commitment and willingness to have taken the risks uh, and risking his life to um, report, do reporting in, in Somalia. Um, Ibrahim would like to continue working as a journalist, um, again, he's just landing on his feet in, uh, in Greece right now and waiting for his formal documents, all his formal documents to be issued, but he's looking to continue to work as a journalist. Now I'm going to go, I'm going back to Hong Kong and, um, and I'm going to be returning to the Snowden refugees, but I'd like to provide a quick update on what's happening in Hong Kong on the slide I have up here now. Um, basically shows from 2014 to 2019 the rapid decline in human rights in Hong Kong and um, in particular uh, rendition and forced disappearances, ill treatment, torture, and even attempted extrajudicial killings. And from 2004 to 2019, um, you know, Hong Kong has become authoritarian. In, and to review what happened last year, uh, Carrie Lam, the chief executive of Hong Kong, had wanted to bring in uh, an act into a law, an extradition bill, which would allow um, rendition of individuals from Hong Kong into mainland China. There would have been a, a formal legal mechanism to do that. Well, the Hong Kong people and lawyers in Hong Kong are very well aware that, Hong, that mainland China's judiciary um, is not independent. It's like any other government department under the executive. Um, it's um, policy and politically motivated in terms of how judges in mainland China um, try criminal cases. Due process rights uh, are limited in, in, China, in the Chinese uh, criminal justice system and at times do not exist. Um, and I'm going to mention the case of Michael Spavor and Michael Kovrig, two Canadians who were detained in two, December 2018. Um, innocent Canadians who have done nothing wrong arbitrarily arrested, detained, and this year, earlier this year, charged uh, with crimes in mainland China. And the mainland Chinese government has uh, effectively admitted that they've, um, they're holding the two Canadians hostage uh, as a bargaining chip uh, to pressure the Canadian government to, to bring an end to the extradition uh, proceedings against uh, Meng Wanzhou um, of the Huawei uh, Chinese telecom group. Um, of significance, so I'm, I'm mentioning this because the the two Michaels cases in in, in China highlight, um, you know, the deficiencies, the clear deficiencies and shortcomings of the criminal justice system in China. And Hong Kong people, you know, were not prepared to accept that they would face justice or accused of a crime and have to go through a criminal justice system in China, mainland China. So protests broke out. People in the millions um, went into the streets from June 19, 2019 onward. And it was in September 2019 that Carrie Lam, the chief executive of Hong Kong, announced that the extradition bill would be withdrawn. So that was a great success. Now, with COVID-19, human rights violations in Hong Kong have just continued on and they've become worse. 
And the Hong Kong government recognizing that millions of people would not be going out in the streets to protest so, uh, under COVID-19 because nobody, you know, everybody understood they, there's a public, serious public health risk and people don't want to get sick. So there were limited protests, but Hong Kong and Beijing calculated that you wouldn't have the millions of people on the streets. And they introduced a bill um, that Beijing actually did this through their own legislature, um, enacting uh, a constitutional provision under the new net, under Article 23 of the Hong Kong Basic Law, which is Hong Kong's constitution, um, basically bringing in new crimes uh, against the state. And I've put in the slide those crimes, uh, secession, subversion, terrorism, collusion with foreign forces. Um, that legislation is a constitutional provision. It's ambiguous, it's poorly written, and it can be interpreted in a way, uh, because of its ambiguity, um, interpreted and used in an arbitrary way and used to violate the, the rights of any, any civilian in Hong Kong. I'm going to go into the scope of, of, of this law. Um, if one is arrested, if a person's arrested under the new national security law, there's no presumption of bail anymore. The defendant actually has the burden of proof on them um, to seek uh, bail. Uh, indefinite detention. Um, if bail's uh, r uh, not granted, that person can be sitting in remand in a jail for months or years before trial. The trials are going to be held behind closed doors. The judges are actually selected by the executive branch of government. They select judges from the judiciary, but it's not the chief justice of the of the Hong Kong Court uh, Court of Final Appeal um, uh, that choose selects the judges to be on that list that the government chooses. Um, in this law, anyone who's accused of a national security offense under Hong Kong's basic law can be renditioned to mainland China to face justice there. So what the Hong Kong authorities were not able to achieve in 2019, they've now, Beijing has now achieved. So that anybody in Hong Kong who is accused of committing a national security crime um, can be brought into mainland China and face justice there. Um, extraterritorial criminality, uh, anybody who writes something, says something, does something that is critical of the Hong Kong government, um, if the Hong Kong authorities feel that this is uh, an act of secession or subversion, um, they can seek the extradition of that person, let's say in Canada or in Germany or another country. So this new national security law has a global reach. Okay? Consequence of this is countries in Europe, including Germany, uh, the United States, Canada, New Zealand, the UK, Australia, have all either suspended or terminated the extradition agreements, treaties that they have with Hong Kong. The reason being is um, the new national security law is a de facto backdoor uh, to, for Beijing to extradite people from around the world. Very few countries have extradition treaties with mainland China because of the shortcomings in its criminal justice system. And... Um, the, I've put up a slide just listing a few countries that have suspended treaties. And um, now within the Hong Kong uh, legal uh, government itself, three branches of government, the executive branch, legislative and judiciary, it's quite clear that Beijing now has uh, firm control over uh, the executive branch of government. Uh, Carrie Lam, um, you know, loyal to Beijing, um, you know, following through on directions from Beijing. Uh, also in 2020, we saw um, officers from uh, mainland China um, now working in Hong Kong side by side with Hong Kong civil servants and, and basically advising and directing. The legislature, um, a number of pro-democracy legislators were removed actually by Beijing and new legislation was um, imposed by Beijing that anyone who um, is viewed as uh, a risk to national security, okay, without trial, uh, can be removed from the legislature. Uh, there were supposed to be elections for the legislature in uh, 
earlier this year. They were canceled because of COVID. Um, and with the new new law imposed by Beijing, there was a mass resignation by the pro-democracy legislators in Hong Kong. So effectively, Beijing has taken control of Hong Kong's legislature. The last or third branch of government, the judiciary, um, there's been a, no a number of cases uh, where judges have brought in their political opinions. Um, most significantly, a non-permanent judge of the Court of Final Appeal, Australian Justice Spiegelman, resigned in September this year from the Court of Final Appeal, uh, citing the new national security law. Freedom of expression in Hong Kong is frozen. Freedom of association, assembly, and mobility have severely diminished. Um, Hong Kong was ranked 18th in the world uh, in terms of freedom of the press uh, and journalism. But in 2020, it's, it fell down to 80th place. Um, in the news right now has been the arrest of Jimmy Lai, the founder of Apa Daily, under the national security law. Bail was denied, but he secured bail last week uh, from the high court. The Department of Justice, uh, Director of Public Prosecutions, uh, has filed an appeal to that, to the Court of Final Appeal, um, to seek... Uh, uh, that the bail be revoked for Mr. Lai. Uh, there's also other examples of journalists like Choi Yuk Ling of RTHK. <clears throat> what the Hong Kong authorities have been doing the last year is if they, if they cannot find a basis to arrest an individual journalist or activist or politician on, under the new national security law, they use some dra draconian uh, laws um, uh, or try to find some technicality to you know, arrest somebody uh, for something that's not even related to their work, um, simply trying to shut shut up or, or stop uh, the media from speaking and writing their stories. Um, in 2000, 2017, there's been an exodus en, en masse from Hong Kong. It's been quiet. It's been steady. Um, but that exodus uh, accelerated in 2019. And... Um, and accelerated even more in 2020 with the new national security law. And, and talking to clients and, and colleagues, the, the shipping and freight companies in Hong Kong are overbooked. Um, uh, that data indicates that there's large num numbers of people leaving Hong Kong. Uh, they do not see a future in Hong Kong. Now, Canada started accepting refugees uh, earlier this year, and in September, um, Canada... Uh, started granting refugee status um, of Hong Kong people who have been politically persecuted because of their participation in protests or they voiced their opinion. Um, Tsong Pei, Pei Wu, uh, the Chinese ambassador to Canada and Ottawa, uh, spoke out, and I'll quote what he said, we strongly urge the Canadian side not to grant so-called political asylum to those violent criminals as refugees because it is interference in China's domestic affairs, and certainly it will embolden those violent criminals. That was on 15th of October, 2020. And, and what is um, uh, interesting here is that China is actually a signatory to the UN Convention relating to the status of refugees. And the Refugee Convention forms part of China's constitution, and part of that is to respect and recognize that other countries will screen uh, asylum seekers and grant them refugee status if they show well-founded fear of persecution, whether it's religion, ethnicity, race, nationality, political opinion, or, or other social group. Um, and, and what's also interesting is that in, under the, the Refugee Convention, under Article 1F and 33.2, but 1F in particular, that if anybody had committed a, a serious violent offense, let's say in Hong Kong, even if they're granted, uh, recognized as a, a refugee, uh, they would not be granted refugee status because of that violence. So the Chinese ambassador to Hong Kong apparently doesn't understand uh, the law and doesn't understand or respect that Canada will be looking at uh, whether any asylum seekers have committed offenses that would exclude them, exclude them from that protection. Um, over the last uh, year, uh, we've seen legislators, former legislators, uh, members of political opposing political parties flee the jurisdiction. Okay. Um, 
what Hong Kong authorities in Beijing have been trying to do is to find bases or whether they're found it, well found, founded or not uh, on evidence, but to arrest them, put them into the Hong Kong criminal justice system. And in applying for bail, typically a condition is they hand over their travel documents. So there are a lot of activists and politicians in Hong Kong who can't leave uh, because they don't have travel documents. Beijing and Hong Kong clearly want to close the borders on anyone who's an op, you know, uh, expresses dissent against the Hong Kong or Beijing governments. But there are, there have been legislators and political activists who have fled. And I've put on a slide, Ray Wong and Alan Lee had fled in 2017, about that time, and were granted refugee status in Germany. Baguio Lung recently fled to the U.S. Simon Cheng, Hong Lao, Sunny Cho, Ted Hoy, Nathan Law, Wayne Chan, Samuel Chu, have all left Hong Kong, and they're all seeking asylum, um, political asylum in, in Western Europe or North America. Now, coming back to the Snowden refugees, um, and what I'd like to do before going into the situation with one Snowden refugee uh, in Hong Kong, I'm just going to give you a quick update on Vanessa and her daughter, who are now resettled in Montreal. They've had a hard time of it um, during the pandemic um, in Montreal. And uh, I've put up a photo from September 2020, which really shows, uh, you know, ex really projects the the feeling, uh, you know, after almost a year of having to practice uh, social distancing and ever other safe practices so they don't get infected or infect others. Um, a nonprofit, uh, just to update everybody, a nonprofit was set up in um, June 2020. Um, the previous private sponsors in, in Montreal had um, stopped uh, providing support to Vanessa and Kiana in April 2020, which put um, this, this single mom and her daughter in a terrible situation without any food or, or rent. And uh, the last of the money uh, that was provided by the private sponsor was provided in early May. So as of June, uh, this family had nothing to survive on. So um, I contacted uh, people I know in the Montreal community and they stepped forward and they set up an, a nonprofit organization called helpvanessa.com. Uh, Oliver Stone, uh, Academy Award winning director, Shailene Woodley, who starred in the Snowden film, also an Oliver Stone film, um, stepped forward and advocated to, in support and to ask for donations for Vanessa and her daughter. And to date, we've raised more than 50,000 Canadian, which um, has now allows Vanessa and her daughter to uh, remain safe and secure during the pandemic and also to continue their French language studies. And this is a photo of them in November 2020, just last month. And this was Christmas Eve. Um, Ken is on the left, Vanessa in the middle, and the third person is Mintum Tran, uh, who's the founder of the nonprofit Help Vanessa and Kiana. I'd like to quickly mention him. Uh, he's the son of a refugee family originally from Vietnam after the war in 1975. The family resettled in Montreal, and he was born in Montreal. Uh, he's a pharmacist and executive director of the Association Professionnelle de Pharmaciens Salariés de Québec. Uh, he founded the nonprofit uh, Help Vanessa and, and Kiana, and he's also founded a new nonprofit called HelpAjith.com. I'm going to go into Ajith's situation. This was 2017. I've put up a photo of Ajith at the removal assessment section of the Immigration Department in Kowloon Bay, and um, this was before a week before immigration rejected Ajith's ref asylum claims. And just briefly, uh, Ajith was injured in the Civil War, uh, protecting his fellow soldiers. He was denied medical assistance under the Geneva Convention by his, uh, the Sri Lankan army. Um, and he, he was put in an untenable situation where he was looking at losing his life. So he fled. He was a military deserter. He was caught a few years later and tortured uh, there was an attempt to execute him, but he managed to flee the military camp and he fled to, to Hong Kong in 2003, leaving behind his wife and a newborn baby girl. 
And this is a, I put up a photo of Ajith in 1993, so you can see you know, the young man that he was. And in Hong Kong, uh, similar to Ibrahim, the Somali journalist, from 2003 onward, Ajith has been subjected to systemic racism and discrimination by the Hong Kong government and its institutions. He's been denied sufficient humanitarian assistance. <clears throat> and I took on his uh, case in 2012. And uh, he's constantly been subjected to racial profiling, even uh, not showing up to conferences, uh, law conferences that I was holding because the police had stopped him on the street as he was trying to get to my office. Um, there's been discrimination by the, you know, by the police immigration against him. And also there's been attacks by the Hong Kong government against myself with the view of removing me as his lawyer. Uh, this is a photo of Ajith uh, a couple of years ago, um, and uh, he's he's had a very difficult time in Hong Kong. Um, for seventeen years, you know he he was subjected. He's been subjected to discrimination, as I've I've uh, described, and all of this has had an an enormously adverse impact on Ajith, and that he's. His his mental condition has has collapsed a number of times, and he's he's just wanted to give up. And uh, he's been what I would describe as a victim of uh, constructive refoulement. But fortunately, we were able to convince him, and uh, we we did have recently tried to get him some help. He's been suffering from post traumatic stress disorder uh, since before he left Sri Lanka, uh, untreated, and only recently we've been able to get him a little bit of help. Um. Going to his role with Mr. Snowden in 2013, when Mr. Snowden arrived, um, Ajit, despite all the terrible things that have happened to him, the persecution he's and discrimination he suffered in Sri Lanka and Hong Kong, Ajit stepped forward and, and you know was more than willing to help Mr. Snowden uh, shelter in 2013. And in 2016, because of Ajit's story coming into the public domain, um, the Hong Kong government targeted him because of his assistance to Mr. Snowden and uh, targeted myself. And in 2018, Ajit was left without the support of the duty law service, but myself and another lawyer found a solicitor willing to instruct us privately to continue his appeal. Now, in parallel to all of this, I advised Ajit to apply to Canada for refugee status a uh, private sponsor was found in Quebec, and uh, Ajith's refugee claims were filed in January 2017. And while all of this was happening, the Sri Lankan police, aware that Ajith is in Hong Kong, uh, sent police officers to Hong Kong in December 2016 looking for him. Um, the Hong Kong police, instead of investigating the Sri Lankan police, made a decision to investigate myself and my clients. Now, Ajith's case was re rejected by immigration in May 2017, and I filed his appeal in the Torture Claim Appeal Board. And this is a major update um, on Ajith's situation in, in Hong Kong, in that his appeal was heard by a, an Australian adjudicator and barrister, Adam Moore, into who took up his, who was the adjudicator in his case in 2017, heard his full appeal in June 2018, and not, no decision has been handed down in three and a half years. From 2018 to November this year, Adam Moore had not handed down a decision, and there is no explanation for that. And then suddenly in November 2020, the Torture Claim Appeal Board announced that uh, Mr. Moore was no longer the adjudicator without giving any reason. And now a, a panel of three adjudicators would hear Ajit's case and start that process all over again. Um, this, is, uh, this is a process that's been delayed and, in my view, abused by the Security Bureau and the Torture Claim Appeal Board. Uh, it is, there's no rational basis why... Um, the Torture Claim Appeal Board did not hand down a decision on Ajit's case years ago. And uh, this is an example of how this part of the judiciary 
uh, there's a lack of transparency and accountability. And um, the second significant event is that one of the three adjudicators is an Australian uh, adjudicator named uh, Fraser Syme. And he's one of the three on the new panel of three for Ajith's appeal. Mr. Syme was also the same adjudicator in the appeal of the other Snowden refugee family of Sapun Nadika and the two children. And Mr. Syme rejected their appeals. And now the Torture Claim Appeal Board has found it proper to appoint Mr. Syme, who's already predetermined, uh, decided refugee grounds for Sapun and his family that are the same grounds for Ajith's case. So there's an adjudicator on the new TCAB panel that has already predetermined the appeal against Ajith, at least on certain refugee grounds. So there's an appearance of bias. There's clearly a conflict of interest. Making matters worse is a judicial review leave application was filed in the High Court in January 2019, challenging Fraser Syme's rejection of Sapun and his family's refugee claims. So the Torture Claim Appeal Board has put in Mr. Syme's knowing full well that his decision in, on the exact refugee grounds um, for Sapun and also Ajit, those common grounds, may be overturned by the High Court. So it's quite clear um, with years of delay, inordinate delay, and the removal or disappearance of Adam Moore as the adjudicator, and com- you know the constitution of a new tribunal after so many years with Fraser Syme on there, that he's not receiving a, a fair process here, a fair hearing. Um, <clears throat> now, in terms of Ajit's mental health situation, uh, the 2019 pro-democracy protests and the police crackdowns, Ajit saw firsthand how the police were acting arbitrarily and attacking innocent bystanders, uh, protesters, and this re-traumatized Ajit. These are the same scenes and the same conduct of police in Hong Kong that he witnessed in Sri Lanka when he was in Sri Lanka. The new national security law, similar to the Prevention of uh, Terrorism Act in Sri Lanka, is another factor which has re-traumatized Ajith, and he's in fear for his life. Making matters worse, there's an immigration amendment bill that's just been brought into the legislature. And mind you, the legislature has no opposition. It's <clears throat> basically pro-Beijing controlled. And in this new legislation, immigration officers will now be able to carry guns and steal batons uh, when dealing with refugees. This is simply going to re-traumatize my client and other refugees. Um, <clears throat> there's now powers to detain asylum seekers effectively indefinitely when they're in Hong Kong. Um, there's new provisions where uh, the immigration officer will decide effectively if interpreters are needed and it'll be the immigration officer's view whether a person uh, a person screening interviews or appeal should be conducted without an interpreter. Um, the other uh, issue that is shocking in my view is after the first stage of immigration screening, if the cases are rejected, There are now powers for immigration officers to go to foreign consulates um, to obtain, uh, to start the process of obtaining uh, travel documents. Uh, That should never happen until after all appeals um, are exhausted. So what's happening is that all these asylum seekers, contrary to UN guidelines, their identities are being exposed at the first stage to foreign governments that they fled from, fled persecution from. Um, usually a hearing could not be held you know, before 28 days uh, in the Torture Claim Appeal Board. Now the limit is seven days, which again... Uh, now, how do I view all of, all of these changes to the immigration legislation? It's just um, a legislative and policy framework that is going to put more pressure on asylum seekers and it violates, in my view, the doctrine of uh, constructive refoulement. We've set up, uh, Mintum Tran in Montreal has set up the 
uh, nonprofit help at jeeth.com and we're asking for donations. Ajith needs support during this time. He is waiting, as with the other stone refugees, the outcomes of their asylum cases in Canada. But pending that time, Ajith needs help. And we'd ask that uh, if you can go to the website and donate, um, you know, no matter how big or small the donations are, um, Ajith needs help. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Ibrahim Mohamed Hussain. I'm a journalist from Somalia. Both the Somali government and Al-Shabaab targeted me. I had been kidnapped and tortured. The reason I was not killed is because my family and friends paid ransom money to spare my life. I fled to Hong Kong only to be treated like a criminal and subjected to racism as I lived in a poverty degraded and treated inhumanly. My life in Hong Kong was like a slow death. I was sent back to Somalia and once again had to run for my life and could not even see my family. I then found my way to Europe leading in Greece. I found myself in two refugee camps fighting again to survive the camps were inhuman and degrading. Many refugees were violently injured and killed inside the camp. What saved me was the refugee screening which proceeded repeatedly. Human rights in Hong Kong do not exist for refugees, but I was lucky to have a human rights lawyer, Mr. Robert Thibault, Without his help, I would not be here today. Thank you very much, guys. I know about a deep torture claim appeal in Hong Kong has been for three and a half years. And I know that the adjudicator for his appeal has disappeared. And there is no decision in his appeal after three and a half years. I know that the appeal board is now starting his appeal start all over again. Now, with the three judges hearing his appeal, I think this is so unfair to Ajit. He has waiting for 17 years for his case to be decided. After almost four years, the appeal board forces him to start all over again. It is the Hong Kong government causing him all this delay. From, from my own experience in, in the Hong Kong appeal board, the judge was unfair and I feel traumatized. For Ajit to again have to go through another appeal will be a real trauma for him. He will be forced to tell his torture experience again. And uh, it will give him nightmare. This is WTF International. You have just seen a recording by Robert is the lawyer of Edward Snowden, and he's now connected to oh, Mr. Thibault. Uh, welcome. Um, thank you for having me here. Um, uh, one thing I had failed to mention in the pre-recorded video uh, discussion is that I, um, two of my clients would have done short videos to introduce themselves to um, uh, the public. And uh, so um, one thing I'd like to um, just mention here, um, as I mentioned at the end of the video, is that uh, Ajith is still um, in Hong Kong, uh, one of the Snowden refugees who who protected Mr. Snowden when he was in Hong Kong in 2013, and he does need help. And uh, one way you can help is by donations. All right. Yeah. Thanks for the. We are now taking questions for Mr. Thibault. You have uh, s several. A during our live program. Um, some of you have asked us questions, and if you go into the streaming window, below that you've got several tabs. One chat window, and if you click on that, you can see the hashtag, hashtag R, which we'll monitor on Mastodon and Twitter, and you can also join the back end on the RSC. So far, there haven't been any questions in the 
the channel. But uh, Mr. Thibault, are there any other ways um, and, and watchers who have just seen what you've presented and the, the very personal messages by your May our voices heard in order to, to foster the cases of those people you, you represent? Yes, as I mentioned, a uh, uh, primary way to support my clients, uh, in particular a GEF at this time, is to is to make donations. Uh, there's a website uh, at GEF, help, help at GEF .com, uh where you can make, make donations uh, various ways from a uh, credit card to uh, Bitcoin. Um, the the other issue is is awareness and discussion. Um, a lot there's a lot of talk about you know the role of whistleblowers, uh, particularly um, in today's world, and um, but there's been less talk about the protection of whistleblowers. And the Snowden refugees did the extraordinary by stepping forward, um, making their decisions of conscience to provide shelter and food and um, compassion to Mr. Snowden when he was in Hong Kong in 2013. And um, uh, in, in all the Snowden refugees cases, uh, one of the grounds for refugee protection is uh, the clients have a well-founded fear of persecution um, based on political opinion in that they made decisions to help Mr. Snowden. And um, so that forms a social group, uh, those who help or protect whistleblowers. And um, I think that, you know, there needs to be more discussion about, um, you know, the importance of people in society who, and, uh, the, you know, the courage that it takes to step forward and to help somebody, uh, particularly for high profile cases. It's, uh, it's easy to help somebody or a group of people um, when it's uh, a popular person or, or a popular cause, um, or if it's a low profile, profile cause, but it's extremely difficult for an individual to step forward to help another um, when even though the cause is uh, the most just cause, um, but it's unpopular. So there are legal and, mor and moral uh, and ethical issues, um, and I think that should be part of the discussion that, that everyone uh, should be having. Thank you for that. Uh, there's been a question on the chat, which I need to rephrase because um, the question is how to build a global consciousness against and uh, to, to join up forces, uh, both from a lawyerly and, and scholarly groups that, that believe more in direct action. Uh, you'll you'll have to repeat that again. Uh, the, the signal came through a bit choppy. Question on the chat: um, Whether there's any any efforts to build a global con state oppression more or less, and uh, coordinate between teams that take a more that leave more in direct action. Um, I think what's happening is you're seeing uh, this kind of action uh, with nonprofits. Uh, lawyers um, through protests, and you're seeing it uh, within communities, within cities, uh, within whole jurisdictions. But I, I think what's happened with the COVID situation is, you know, that that's basically compelled everybody because of the public health issues, you know, iso self isolating, social distancing, masks. We've, we've had to take a step back to think, okay, how do we communicate now? How do we interact and, and exercise our fundamental rights and freedoms? So I think we're in a, in a dangerous period where, um, you know, we're, we're still struggling how to connect globally uh, to cooperate and bring this kind of awareness about. Um, the second issue is to do that, you need to be able to get the message out through advocacy and activism. Um, right now, the, the COVID pandemic consumes the media reports. Uh, I've been told about 75 or 85% of you know, news coverage in a given uh, media organization, 75 to 85%. Um, at the same time, governments are using the cover of COVID, uh, the global pandemic, to suppress freedom of expression and uh, to strip away fundamental rights and freedoms. So I think the question is a great question. And I think it's a matter of, you know, when doing this through encrypted means, doing it where you have your privacy for global groups to consider how do we connect up together? What messages we want to get out? 
But then the real challenge will be getting the message out through um, to the public uh, because of the current uh, global pandemic. Are there already um, well to to go ahead and prepare all the messaging to to come out of the pandemic if and when it together? I, I as far like I'm not aware of of any concerted efforts uh, globally. I mean, there are some nonprofits around the world who are trying to get you know messages out. They're trying to get stakeholders of those affected in different jurisdictions, but but right now. Um, Uh, I'm not aware of, of, you know, any organized concerted effort to to try to have this sort of global connection and, 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 uh, and being able to speak globally, but also locally, you know, informing the, the global community what's going on. Um, I think we're, it, it's just a um, difficult time. Uh, one of the best examples is Hong Kong with COVID, the COVID, uh, Uh, pandemic there there's been four waves and in the midst of the second wave of the pandemic in Hong Kong Beijing imposed the new national security law uh, which basically has stripped away um, you know fundamental rights and freedom of expression um, so I think we're just in a difficult time and it's going to be for different groups around the world to figure out how to communicate um, you know uh, hopefully the pandemic will come to an end in the, the end of this year or next year and, um, you know, see where we go from there. There's one more question from the chat and I think it's a softball pitch more or less. Free autonomous press or free autonomous media as in decentralized, uh, probably un on of uh, getting the message out. I, uh, the, the signal's a bit choppy. I've missed the middle of your question. If you could repeat it. That would you say that a free and autonomous press, autonomous media, as in decentralized, probably uncensorable, would be a cornerstone of getting the message out? Uh, ab absolutely. Um, you know, one one thing that I've talked about in, in past talks, and um, is that two two things have happened, uh, is ha are happening at this time, and have been happening over the last decade, and that is. Um, uh, The journalism has, you know, mainstream journalism is being eroded. Uh, investigative journalists uh, are fewer in number today, and journalism has become more centralized in major urban centers. Uh, and in, in smaller cities, towns, rural areas, uh, there is no more journalism there at all in, in, in a lot of regions around the world. And when those things happen, Uh, you have poor behavior of local government um, in terms of policies, uh, public expenditure, and also abuses of human rights. Um, we, we are really in desperate need of having independent, uh, autonomous journalists and journalism um, at this time, more than ever. Um, and, uh, but at the same time, you know, journalists who have the capacity and capability to do investigative journalism. Um, you know, that the, the problem with what's, what's been happening in the last five years, 10 years, is that the media that's centered in the major urban centers, um, they're not picking up stories and speaking for the more vulnerable or those who are geographically outside of the main areas. And that's a very dangerous thing. So yes, I agree, uh, there should be more autonomous media And um, uh, there should not be censoring on that media. So, in fact, if you if you look at that, um, I mean, um, encrypted communication is well, and, and everybody should use it, especially to to exchange information uh, with journalists. But in the end, for the for the general public, um, independent media that is not centralized in in some some few conglomerates uh, might even be more efficient to get the, the message out to the broader masses, right? Uh, absolutely. I, I think what needs to be done is you need more autonomous journalism and journalists in smaller cities, operating autonomously in the bigger cities um, to be able to pick up stories. Um, what, what you're seeing right now with, with 
me, the mainstream media focusing on COVID stories, uh, for example, the US elections and Donald Trump, are that they're not picking up smaller stories. They're not picking up low profile stories anymore. Um, and governments are taking advantage of that. They, they know that they can act almost with impunity because they know that the smaller stories where somebody in your communities, you know, fundamental rights are being violated by the government or local authorities, it's not gonna get reported at this time. Um, when the pandemic is over, the situation will be the same. There's a lack of independent autonomous journalists. Um, one of the big problems is, is money. Um, you know, a lot of the money that used to go into advertising for mainstream media, uh, even local newspapers, is now going online. People are spending their time looking at, you know, online media that has nothing to do with their local communities or their even their countries. Um, people are spending their time on YouTube and Facebook, uh, TikTok is another example, where all the advertising is going. Um, so we, we have a situation where enormous amounts of money are going to um, only certain media, some of the mainstream, a lot of it to you know social entertainment online and infotainment. Um, and the money's disappearing from, that money's disappearing and it's having an impact on two things. One is the funding of investigative journalism. And number two, uh, being able to find and support autonomous local media in smaller cities, towns, and rural areas. And I've seen that here in North America. Um, and I know the same thing's been happening in, in Europe and also in uh, Australia and New Zealand. Alrighty, so this means subscribing to your local small town newspaper might be even uh, as, as well as a, as a step in, in uh, joining the revolution as uh, using encrypted messaging. Absolutely, well, it's, it's, gotta, it's gotta be a grassroots effort from the ground up. Everybody can take their part. We do not have a stage, so uh, you have to imagine the applause that you're getting via IRC right now. Thank you again so much for being with us, Robert Thibault. Thank you.